So welcome to the second part of this series in which we're looking at new IF transformer designs. In this uh, second part, I'm just going to initially go through some of the objectives I want to cover in this series, in this video rather. And uh, so without further ado, let's uh, take a look at the objectives. So one of the first things that we should look at, of course, is the original material. Uh, where did I get this idea from? Let's take a look at some of the website materials some forums that I went through and found some of this. Uh, some other people that had tried to do the similar uh, thing of trying to recreate an IF transformer um, on based from new technology or more recent technology rather than trying to do something like say uh, put together a coil winder and, and try to rediscover the black art of doing honeycomb winding using uh, Litz wire. I'll go through the, the bench jig that I created to do the testing and to determine whether this was actually something that could be feasibly made out of new parts. Uh, I had my doubts about this naturally because I thought that you know for example the coil had to be honeycomb wound with a, a, a distinct air gap and um, a fairly low uh, core material. I mean, you didn't, you couldn't use, for example, an iron core because it would um, absolutely ruin the Q factor. We'll go some of the through some of the bench testing that I uh, I did. Um, also, look at some of the transformer loading models that I came up with. These are models that are used on the secondary of the transformer and uh, are used to determine what the loading of the secondary does on the gain and the Q factor and the selectivity of the transformer design. We'll look at some of the test results that, results that I found uh, based on my testing. And finally we'll go through some of the schematic designs I did. We'll look at the, the design uh, of the circuit and we'll look at some of the options that were added into the schematic to help adapt the transformer to different types of radio circuits that you might be trying to put this transformer replacement into. So without further ado, we'll uh, get to the first part and uh, start looking at the original material. This page here uh, from Antique Radios is a topic posted by P uh, author PBPIX on uh, June 18th, 2012. For reference, the topic number is 196404. In this, he outlines a method that he found by creating a very uh, simple IF transformer uh, unshielded by using uh, first a terminal strip to create the uh, space separated two tank circuits and the consisting of a choke uh, bulk capacitor and a tuning capacitor and then later on uh, adapting that to a perf board circuit here. In this article he does mention that he did get some inspiration from this from an, a site that is maintained by YouTuber Glasslinger, where he outlines a way to make an IF transformer from the more modern 355 or 455 uh, kilohertz IF transformers that are prevalent in a later radios, uh, especially uh, battery operated portable radios. In that design, he couples two transformers together on a board. However, the problem with this design is that it's just as hard to find these transformers as it is to find the old antique air wound IF transformers in the tall RF shield. So this first solution that I showed is actually ends up being the better one to use because the parts are more readily available and you can just put
put them on a PC board as you like. It's an interesting read. If people are interested, they can go to the site. Um, there's two pages of discussion in here, and they talk about various factors, uh, Q factor, coupling, the load uh, on the tube, because of course this transformer on the primary side is coupled to the plate and it acts as the essentially the plate impedance uh, on the uh, the driving side of the transformer so this is the jig that I ended up putting together based on uh, what I saw in uh, research and what other people had done we have a, a, just an MDF block here with two sliding elements and you can very precisely put the air gap between the two, the primary and the secondary uh, using the um, sliding motion and then locking it down once you have the correct distance. <clears throat> Another thing that I added into this uh, that wasn't in the original material is the ability to add in a shield. So if you want to see what the effects of an aluminum shield are on the transformer coupling characteristics, you can add a shield in, reposition it, and in that case it's a bit too far apart. Maybe this one would work better. We can re reposition it back to the point where we had it and we can see what the shield does to affect the coupling between the primary and the secondary. These components are fairly easily taken off. In this case I'm testing the axial choke which was ended up being the the more approachable design uh, for the transformer. Uh, I had also tested the axial chokes these are um, wound this way across around a uh, toroidal, or not a toroidal, but a um, ferrite core. And whereas these are a, a kind of a dipped compound, I, it's a dog bone style toroidal coil in here. The winding is this way in this direction, and then they're coated and then marked. Uh, some people may recognize this as the as the transformer that came out of the prototype or the radio. So that's another shot of it. This is the first iteration I did where I just used perf board to mount all the parts on here. I just used surface or through hole capacitors and I mounted it onto uh, the original base of the transformer. This is happens to be the one that was destroyed which caused uh, this entire investigation to, to happen in the first place. And this uh, jumble of capacitors here is just a, an example of a, a secondary impedance load that I put together to test the effects of this on the secondary. Um, this represents something like a 12BA6 IF amplifier tube. Here we see a uh, schematic diagram of a, uh, a Bulova T100, a fairly typical All-American 5 layout. We have the 12BE6 converter tube going into the first IF and then out of the first IF we have the IF amplifier, the 12BA6. So in order to see what effect the 12BA6 has on the first IF transformer secondary, we have to kind of model the impedance characteristics of the 12BA6. So here we see a, a 12BA6 uh, ideal load model in which uh, we just essentially tie both the ground and the, and the B plus together and take a look at all of the components in the circuit that end up 
going to ground or going to B plus. Uh, since from an ideal perspective, the impedance of the power supply is supposed to be near zero ohms. When you look at the impedance of a circuit, it doesn't really matter if the component's going to ground or, or B plus, it's the same thing. In the, in the uh, documentation for the 12BA6, they note that the grid to cathode capacitance is in the order of around 5.5 picofarads. In the AVC circuit, we have a, a combination of capacitance and resistance, which ends up dominated by the 0 0.47 microfarad AVC bypass or filter cap. At IF frequencies, this is essentially a short circuit. So we can just reduce all of this basically to 0 ohms at 455 kilohertz. So our impedance is essentially dominated by the grid uh, cathode capacitance in the 12BA6. And going back to our example here, I can see that um, these two capacitors here end up being the, uh, these are 10 picofarads, so putting them in series we get five picofarads of effective capacitance. This represents the 0 0.47 on the other side, and so this is effectively the load of the secondary on the IF. And by putting this into the circuit, we can see or have a, a fairly good match between what actually happens in the circuit and uh, what happens in the model. Just going back to the ideal load model, um, one of the interesting aspects of having a, a capacitive load on the secondary is it ends up actually merging with the internal capacitance of the transformer secondary and uh, shifting the IF frequency of the secondary once the load's applied. So if our internal capacitance here is 100 picofarads, we're adding 5 picofarads of capacitance externally because of the 12BA6. We end up actually having a represented capacitance of 105 picofarads here instead of 100, and this tends to shift the natural harmonic or the, the frequency at which this resonates down to a lower frequency. So we have to trim the trimmer capacitor that's also in this component here to bring it back to where it is once it's actually applied in circuit. In the ideal characteristics of a choke, we have a, an inductor, which between the two points has an, a pure inductance of L. The capacitance is zero, or infinite, uh, rather, and the resistance is zero ohms. In reality, the inductor can be modeled more like this, where each of these represents a turn, we have a very small capacitance between windings. And there is a resistance, of course, because of the wire. So we have interwinding capacitance, we have the inductance resulting in a, in a fairly complicated LCR circuit. What this means is that when we use chokes, particularly the, the, uh, the axial style 
chokes that we are using in this design where they're wound around a dog bone style choke. This capacitance is going to come into play and it's actually going to cause a point in the frequency where this naturally resonates. So what we can see as a result is we have a circuit that looks more like this. For these chokes that we're use that I'm using in these designs, this resonating point is a is a roughly a megahertz. And there's another point at which these capacitors uh, take part in the frequency response curve, and that's when the capacitive component in the inductor becomes the predominant uh, impedance, meaning that at such a high frequency, the inductance is a very, very high impedance. The capacitance becomes a very low impedance, and effectively the inductor short circuits. This, this frequency is sufficiently high, though, for these that we're not really worried about that too much. What does have a, an impact, or possibly impact, is the the self-inductance point of the choke. We well, have to be aware of that. Putting a larger bulk capacitor in here in our design does pull the self-resonant frequency down to where we want, but keep in mind that when you're determining the component values for this, it's not as simple as just using 1.2 millihenries here, or Fn being 450 kilohertz, 455 kilohertz, we want to try to determine C, the answer we get is not going to be the actual capacitance that we need because there's already some capacitance inherently in the inductor. So just some of the points that I wanted to discuss on, uh, on the realities of inductors and, and things we have to just put up with in, in, uh, and compensate for in our designs. So the first experiment done with the jig was to take a look at the axial Epcos style chokes and how they performed. Uh, that would be this style of choke here. In the test setup, we can see that the scope is set up on the primary. And the signal generator is also in the primary. I decoupled the loading of the of the uh, signal generator a bit using a 1K resistor here, because the internal impedance of the signal generator is 50 ohms. On the secondary, we have another channel to the scope, and RS is a a loading resistor that's varied depending on the uh, on the phase of the test. L1, the inductor in both of these is a 1.2 millihenry. Our fixed capacitor is a 68 picofarads, and the variable capacitor is a 2.5 to 22 picofarad trimmer. Of course, our objective is to couple 455 kilohertz IF frequency. The Various measurements here are with different loading resistors, RS, varying from 100K all the way up to 1 mega ohm. We take a look at the impact of the distance. D is the distance between the D2 chokes in millimeters. FL is the 3 dB point of the low side of the frequency. <clears throat> this is the effective bandwidth of the IF coupling and the phase shift between the two 
waveforms on the primary and the secondary also are looked at. As you can see, <clears throat> as the secondary load uh, impedance decreases, the, the effective air gap between the primary and the secondary have to also decrease. And so we go from about 10 millimeters to 1 megohm to down to 7.5 millimeters uh, when it's 100K. We can also see that the effective bandwidth or the Q factor goes down as the secondary loading resistance also goes down. At 1 megohm, we have about 6.8 kilohertz of bandwidth. When we reach 100 K, we're up to 22 kilohertz of bandwidth, which is uh, completely unusable. We want to try and stay in this region here. So that tells us that regardless of how close we put the primary and the secondary coils together, we really have to keep the impedance load of the secondary quite high. In the second IF experiment, we used the second style of choke, the radial style. And in this case, it's an Abricon LLC AIUR16122K. That's the DigiKey number. It is a quote unquote in shielded, and it's just a standard winding about a, a central core here. The impedance of the choke is the same at 1.2 millihenries. Capacitance, the bulk capacitance is still at 6.68 picofarads and our trimmer is the same at 2.5 to 22 picofarads. Uh, looking at our test results, we see that um, our distance between the two chokes is actually quite a bit smaller. Uh, we're, we're around 5 millimeters here down to like 1.4 here. And the bandwidth is also not very good. I mean, even with infinite uh, impedance, a load impedance on the secondary, we're still looking at about 10.4 kilohertz. And this is one of the reasons why I decided to kind of abandon this style of choke, um, just because I couldn't really get a decent Q factor out of it and keep the selectivity nice by having a very tight uh, 3 dB bandpass characteristic. I use uh, KiCad for all my schematic captures and PCB designs. I've so I've opened up the uh, transformer schematic. This is a page that shows all three PCBs: the uh, the lower PCB, the main vertical PCB, and the upper PCB. So the circuit is a little confusing. It's actually showing two transformers here and that's because there's 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 considerations made for both axial and radial uh, chokes to be used in the circuit, one or the other. So these represents different hole layouts and just for convenience I I tie the circuits together even though in reality only these or these would be used in the circuit but not both. The bulk capacitor is uh, is also here. This is a surface mount part, and this is a surface mount part. If you want, you can use through-hole capacitors. You just use this hole uh, pads for the radial choke uh, as the the holes for the capacitor, and that's what I ended up doing in the in the first part of this series, where you saw me assembling one. I used through-hole capacitors and I actually used the, the pads that were intended for this transformer here. On the lower PCB, uh, for the primary, it just really has one part and that's the trimmer capacitor for the primary. Also on the lower PCB are some components that can be put in on the secondary part of the circuit. 
This is a loading capacitor or loading resistor that can be added in as needed. It's an 0805 surface mount resistor. And we have here a capacitor that can be used uh, in some situations which require uh, a capacitive output on the secondary lug here, resulting in three terminal outputs. I've uh, brought up a schematic here showing a uh, radio using a IF transformers to highlight a case in which a capacitor is required on the secondary of the transformer. Uh, this is indicated by here, by C11. As you know, it is in the envelope of the transformer part, and so it's expected to be inside of the transformer. This this here, C11, corresponds to this optional capacitor here that can be added into the secondary if needed. So this wraps up the two-part series on the IF transformer design that I came up with. Uh, in the first part, we saw the construction of the device, and it's put into a test radio. Uh, the second part of this video that we just finished was the design aspects of the transformer where where the design came from original concepts test jigs and models i hope that uh, this information can be helpful to other people who come across the same situation where they have a permanently damaged if transformer and a radio that they're trying to restore and the only solution is to just come up with a new one and this is in cases where they don't have a new old stock part or another part that they can transfer from one radio to another. I hope everybody is doing well in these times and I'm going to sign off now and wishing everybody well. Take care now.